stopping Shelton Benjamin now. Hey there everybody, Brian Zane here and welcome to my brand new set. That's right, it's a new year and it's time for a new look, change in directions here in Wrestling With Regret. Okay, well that's a bit of a lie. Uh, I'm actually here at a relative's house because uh, I am one of the tens of thousands of people currently uh, affected in the Pacific Northwest by power outages as a result of this big winter storm that hit recently. Uh, don't worry about us, the Zane family is doing all right. We have no electricity, but uh, we have a gas fireplace. We have a propane stove uh, for camping and I have a car that can charge a lot of devices. But uh, we don't have the ability to film at Regret HQ because of this, so I am just here displaced at the moment. So thank you for bearing with me as we have this temporary change in the dynamic here, but the classic reviews still roll on. It is Royal Rumble season, so you know I'm gonna go to some classic Rumble pay-per-views, and we're going to the first one that was ever broadcast in HD. Whoa, man, the game has totally changed. It's the 2008 Royal Rumble from January 27th at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Of course, the last time the Rumble took place here was in 2000. That was a pretty classic version of the Rumble in its own right. When I was re-watching the old Raws and Smackdowns in preparation for this show, I was kind of being reminded why I considered this period as a fan to be kind of a dark period uh, watching WWE. Because not only was this in the fallout of what happened with Chris Benoit only several months earlier, this is also, you know, they have to scramble for all that, and then everything else they're doing creatively, to me, just a lot of it's not hitting for whatever reason. It might, because, it might be because of still, oh, feeling weird after what happened in the Benoit story or maybe just my tastes in wrestling were beginning to change because of where I was partly because of where I was at that point in my independent wrestling career because that was definitely influencing what I liked and didn't like at that time and I think uh, not to mention my own life place just coming out of college and struggling to find you know work in television while also trying to pursue this wrestling thing on the side there was nothing about this watching it at the time and then watching it again in preparation for this that really got me jazzed up to watch the pay-per-view except for you know knowing what we know at the very end of the show you know and we'll get to that just under 20,800 people packed MSG for this show 575,000 pay-per-view buys it's actually up from 525 the previous year Jonathan Coachman and Michael Cole are on the call for Smackdown and our first match is one of the career threatening variety as MVP takes on the real star of the Iron Claw I'm talking about the nature boy Ric Flair so Flair has been given an old ultimatum by Mr. McMahon. The next match you lose, it's gonna be your last match ever, your career will end. And so for the last several weeks, every single time you see Ric Flair enter the ring, there's all this drama that's been wrought from it where it's like, is this the last time we're gonna see Ric Flair wrestle and walk that aisle one more time? Are these fans here in uh, you know, Nebraska gonna be the place to see Ric Flair's final match? But it did set off this big win streak for Ric Flair by hook or by crook and even under some pretty disappointing circumstances, Flair would continue to win matches. And this was the latest stop on that tour. It was basically MVP. The, he's the US champion at this time. The title's not on the line. And I don't know about y'all, but that's a dead giveaway for me. MVP with an early advantage hits the big kick to the head. I'm surprised that was not enough for Flair to bleed. Rick is attacking the leg, but MVP does not go down easily. MVP with the Yakuza kick in the corner. He makes the cover. Flair with the rope break. The referee, Charles Robinson, of course, Little Nate is involved. He makes the count, but he catches the rope break and waves it off. Flair tries to fight back. We get this double down on a collision out of the corner. The Nature Boy gets his chops and his woos in. MVP goes for one of the worst finishers of all time with the Playmaker, but Flair counters with a figure four, and MVP taps. Flair wins and gets his standing ovation at Madison Square Garden. I give it two and a half stars out of five. You know, it's crazy. The last classic review I did was Flair's return in ring to the WWF, the Royal Rumble 02 versus Mr. McMahon, and it's crazy to see uh, where his career had taken him from that point to this, as we are entering his first retirement run, basically, in WWE. This is obviously leading up to Shawn Michaels and WrestleMania 24, so of course MVP is not winning this one, and honestly, if you've seen one Ric Flair match, especially at this point in time, you've kind of seen them all. I think the moment of Flair getting his due at Madison Square Garden, I think that's the real uh, point to this whole segment because, you know, the match itself 
take it or leave it, and it's a foregone conclusion, honestly, but, uh, you know, the moment is there. Backstage, Mr. McMahon's having a chat with his son, Hornswoggle. Yes, this angle is still going on, and yes, I still hate it. Vince is talking about the history of his family at Madison Square Garden, and he tells Swoggle he can't trust anybody in the Rumble match, not even his pal Finley. And just like that, Finley enters the room, and Vince pivots, warns Finley, you can't even trust the little guy in the Rumble. Finley shrugs it off and takes Hornswoggle out with him like a little child. Did I mention how much I hate this angle? I mean, I've done a whole video on it in the past, the Hornswoggle McMahon video. You can go check it out if you want for more detail. But again, it's just really hard to watch this and just see like, man, WWE has a really weird relationship with, you know, little people wrestlers, midget wrestlers, call them what you will. But yeah, the whole infantilization of them, in particular, this one for Hornswoggle, like why else would they go to that point if not for the fact because of his height? We go to Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler on the call for Raw. They're tossing over to their newest broadcast colleague, Mike Adamley. Oh no! Mike Adamley, the very talented sports broadcaster who's best known for calling football games as well as the original American. American Gladiators. He is part of the team now, kind of being the roving reporter, the Todd Pettengill, if you will, sitting out there in the crowd. He's putting the MSG crowd over. He begins shouting about the Chris Jericho JBL rivalry, and we go to that match now after a hype package. John Bradshaw Layfield taking on Chris Jericho. Jericho, of course, that was a big story. He come back late in 2007. He was the answer to all those Save Us Matrix vignettes. And so then on the Raw after Randy Orton won the WWE championship. Jericho did come back for the first time in three years, but just kind of rehashing the same act he did when he debuted for them back in 1999. He still had like the glittery top, saying a lot of the similar catchphrases. The, only, the main difference was, honestly, was he had a new finisher in the code breaker, and then his hair had been cut short. And besides that, though, he felt really kind of a copy and paste from what he had done in 99, which I thought was, you know, even at that point, as excited as I was to see him back in the ring, I thought, huh, that's kind of weird because, you know, even in that period between, you know, 99 and 2005 when he first took his break, I think he had grown a lot as a character from there. And so for him to go back to that uh, in earnest, uh, based on what he said in his book about that uh, comeback, it just felt like kind of an interesting misstep. He immediately challenged Randy Orton to a title match at Armageddon. That was back in December. The match ended in a DQ once JBL left the commentary desk to beat him up. JBL has now jumped from SmackDown to Raw under a massive shower of pyro and explosions. Anytime someone gets an overly excessive amount of pyro, whether it's meant as a gag or it's like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like, look at this guy. We're going to give him a lot of pyro. It always makes me laugh. JBL also basically lynched Jericho on Raw a couple of weeks ago with nobody helping him out. Then he cuts a promo on Jericho's kids and called their dad a coward. The story at the beginning of this matchup is how JBL is seemingly very calm and collected in this and Jericho is very emotional. Y2J plus seven actually gets the walls locked in fairly early, but Jibbles gets the rope break. Who is this guy in the front row with the hat. I am dying watching him in action here. Jericho is dropped neck first onto the rope and JBL continues to work the damaged area. Some big old soup bones in the corner. Jericho fights up from a sleeper. He's able to knock JBL down with his own clothesline. He's thrown into the ring post and is busted wide open on the opposite side of his head from where he hit. Jericho starts to come back. It sounds like he's being booed out of nowhere, but I think it's something else happening off, you know, off camera in the crowd because they begin cheering again when Jericho hits the lion salt. Fighting on the outside, Jericho with a big old dink to JBL's head with a steel chair. The match ends in a DQ win for Layfield. Jericho's far from over though. He throws the chair at JBL, grabs some camera cables, and chokes JBL with it. A huge Y2J chant as a very bloody Jericho is trying to murder this man. What a moment in MSG. The match itself, I gotta give two stars, but the overall segment I think was very powerful. The whole story of Jericho getting his, you know, his moral victory against JBL after what John had done to him weeks prior, I think was really good for the storyline. I think it was that much needed Jericho needs to get his edge back sort of thing for me, especially after kind of how lukewarm I thought that his return was, all, all things told. But I think that him getting that edge and being that violent, I think really just elevated the storyline. It elevated 
his return to me, it did bring about just more of like a different side of him. And I think that was really helpful going forward. We see Ashley Massaro backstage. She goes to Maria's locker room. Dang, she gets her own place. But her boyfriend Santino Morella pops out and tells her she's getting ready for the first ever HD kiss cam. Santino goes, Maria is not interested in you or your booby magazine. I wish I could vote you out of WWE like they did on Survivor, which is a pretty good burn. Do you like Santino here? Good, because this show is just full of him. Up next, the World Heavyweight title Edge defense against Rey Mysterio. Edge and Rey Mysterio sharing a ring together? What year is it? Edge has claimed the world title at Armageddon thanks to a big plan between he and his main squeeze, the GM of SmackDown, Vicky Guerrero. They've also added some more muscle as the major brothers are now Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder, the Edge heads. Rey Mysterio has won a Beat the Clock challenge with some help from Batista and The Undertaker who were screwed earlier in that Beat the Clock episode. And the big emotional crux of this matchup here isn't so much Ray just trying to regain the world championship. Um, there is kind of that lingering Eddie tie-in in in this storyline here because uh, Ray is trying to, you know, I guess trying to talk Vicky out of the dark side and try to convince her that, you know, Edge doesn't really love her. Edge protests this and ultimately Ray will be proven right in storyline, but, uh, you know, Edge is obviously, you know, uh, standing up for that and protesting, how dare you sort of thing. Chavo Guerrero is involved here. He's starting to help out. La Familia is forming as we speak. Bam Neely not far behind. Ray is booed and Edge is cheered at MSG. I have to say I did not expect that. Ray is hit with a baseball slide to the outside. Hawkins and Ryder are approaching him. The referee catches them and ejects them from the match. Back and forth they go. Edge kicks out Ray's leg from under his leg and continues to work on his surgically repaired knee. Edge now starts going for Ray's knee brace. Mysterio is able to fight him off for a bit, even able to hit a top rope double stomp. Ray is working this combination of hope and pain as Cole very poetically puts it as he slides out and hits Edge with a tornado DDT. Edge goes for the spear, but he misses. Ray on one bad leg, still able to pull off the 619, the splash. But wait, Vicky Guerrero pops out of her wheelchair and breaks up the pin. Another 619 attempt, but Vicky puts herself in harm's way, sacrificing herself to allow Edge to intercept Ray with a spear and get the win. Edge retains the title. The baddies check on Vicky on the floor. Zack Ryder looks to be in absolute shock over this travesty. I love the sell. It's my pick for the match of the night. I think that these two, it goes without saying, given their history, that these two are going to have great chemistry together as rivals or as partners. And uh, on this night, I think they were really well together. That finish in particular kicked ass. And that's what I'm going to take away from this almost above anything else. I thought it was great storytelling for Vicky to take that bullet. And, uh, you know, then the ending, is the spear in midair. I thought that was all really well done. Backstage, Ric Flair congratulated by Mr. Kennedy. He says once he wins the Royal Rumble between now and Mania, he would like nothing better, dot, dot, dot. But before he can finish his thought, his current rival, Shawn Michaels, interrupts and kicks him out. Shawn shows up to congratulate Rick. So does Batista, and so does Triple H. A little bit of tension here between trips and bats over the Rumble match, but HBK breaks the ice by shilling his merch. Oh, Shawn, you scamp. Maria arrives to start the Royal Rumble Kiss Cam. We get a lot of folks going along with it, but mostly people resisting. Then Ashley shows up and she says she got a call last week from her good friend Hugh Hefner and he wanted to know if Maria wanted to pose for Playboy. But like, why wouldn't Hugh just call Maria? I don't get that. Before she can say anything though, out comes Santino Morella and obviously Big Dick Johnson covered up in a black sheet because who the hell else is it going to be in 2008? Santino playing the role of Eddie Guerrero to Maria's China and saying nobody wants to see Maria naked. Santino then makes several local sports team references, which gets a Let's Go Giants chant. Maria is thinking about the offer, but Santino tells Ashley to buzz off and brings in his special friend, obviously Big Dick Johnson, with a Patriots logo on his belly and a soon to poorly aged 19 and 0 printed on the back of his Speedos. You know, Pats fans, maybe their loss to the Super Bowl that year was karma for what Big Dick did. Anyway, spoiler alert, Maria's going to pose for Playboy, as if you didn't realize. We get a Baywatch-themed Mania 24 promo with Kelly Kelly and Mae Young. Then we go back to Mike Adamley. He's been sitting there waiting anxiously. Another man who's been waiting anxiously, Jeff Harvey. Hardy. Uh, it's a classic botch by Adamley on his first night on the job. It's actually edited out of the rebroadcast and on the network, so very clever what they did there. You know, uh, early, very, very early on. 
run, in the run of Wrestling with Regret, when we were coming up with like episode ideas. Mike Adam Lee's time in WWE was always there in the back of our minds because, oh, didn't he say some silly things and said some weird stuff on the job? And then, of course, the longer time passes and you learn more about Mike Adam Lee's, you know, his CTE diagnosis and the trauma, the brain trauma he was living with and working through back then and through this, it's like, suddenly that idea becomes a lot more mean-spirited. And so that's why there will never be a Mike Adam Lee in WWE video. But anyway, on we go now to the match for the WWE title as Randy Orton defends against Jeff Hardy. It's the first time that WWE and Intercontinental Champions faced off at the Rumble. Back at Armageddon, Jeff Hardy beat Triple H to become the number one contender for the title. And you'll see that historically, Armageddon's a very good pay-per-view for Jeff. Anyway, in the build-up for this, Randy Orton has been wreaking havoc on Jeff. He kicked his brother Matt in the place where his appendix used to be, but then also right in the dome. Jeff responded with his famous dive off the raw set and into a big wooden box on Orton that saw both men laid out and carried on stretchers out of the arena. We get good back and forth to start us off here. We get some headlocks, some leg scissors, Hardy with some quick offense, a huge drop kick by Hardy into Orton's chest on the outside. Look at how Orton hit the wall there. Jeff hits a dive as well, goes for a springboard, but Orton kicks him in midair and he takes a tumble. Orton works over Hardy methodically for a while, but Jeff fights back, dives off the apron of the outside once again. Orton's got Jeff in that chin lock for a good long while, but Hardy eventually fights out and comes back. Hits one of the most satisfying whispers in the wind I'd seen in a while. Look at the extra oomph that one seemed to have. Lands and connects perfectly. He drop picks Orton out of the ring. We get a big old moonsault. Back in the ring, Jeff goes for the twist of fate, but Orton counters beautifully into an RKO. The cover and the win, Orton retains. I give it three and a half stars out of five. You know, I talked about the Edge Ray Mysterio matchup, how, how often those two were paired together over the years. You can say a lot of the same things about, you know, Jeff Hardy and Randy Orton. Those two, I think, also have a really good history together as rivals, especially. Um, I think the flow of the match, the fact that Orton worked so slow, almost to a painful degree, but Jeff still being able to be that faster competitor, the quicker offense, the high flying attempts, I think made it a really good balance. And of course, the RKO out of nowhere finish you know, it gets me almost every time. Hardy wouldn't get his moment in the sun until the end of this year, but boy, this match really did change the perception of him as a possible top guy going forth. Joey Styles and Taz are on the call for ECW. Holy crap, I had no idea these guys were here. They're here to introduce the By the Numbers package, which of course includes that one bit at the beginning of the WrestleMania 14 Tag Team Battle Royal when they're like 30 men. Like, why do you lie with your footage? The Rumble has never been that full of people, and they always use the Battle Royal start because we just got to show it's a lot of dudes, but like it's never really the way we tell you it is at this point. So battle royal, like that always irked me. Well, folks, it's time for the main event, the Royal Rumble match. Now, the build for this matchup was really interesting. I think this year's Rumble had the unfortunate distinction of you didn't really know who was a surefire victory for the Rumble match because you didn't really know, like, you didn't really feel comfortable about any of the main event stuff. Like, me personally as a fan, I, you know, I could have taken or left Orton and Edge as champions at that point. Uh, I wasn't really feeling either of their reigns. And I think that like, you look at the landscape in the Rumble match itself, like who's gonna win that's like, what's a matchup I really wanna see out of any of these combinations? I wasn't really feeling it, honestly. Like, I don't know if anyone else feels the same way, but like I said at the top of this review, my kinda like, I don't know if it was just the overall vibes I had toward WWE during this time or what, but even like looking back at this show, if I didn't have knowledge of how the Rumble match is going to end, I would still look at this and go like, who the fuck, who's gonna win this thing? And like, I don't, uh, Triple H, I guess? Fine, uh, okay. Well folks, he's not just for WCW anymore. Michael Buffer introducing the match, doing his classic line. I mean, it's really a match made in heaven. Number one and number two are the final two from last year's Rumble, The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. So things are off to a pretty hot start here. Some close calls early on. Then we get at number three, Santino Morella, who is promptly eliminated by The Undertaker. At number four, the great Kali shows up. He hits The Undertaker with his bop. There's a You Can't Wrestle chant for Kali. He goes for another bop, but misses and is eliminated. At number five, Hardcore Holly, one half of the tag team champs in the ring now. Here's a throwback to last year with Taker and Sean. At number six, John Morrison. Number seven, Tommy Dreamer. Big reaction for him as he wears the pay-per-view shirt. Aw. Number eight is Batista. Dreamer breaks up an interaction with Batista and Taker and is thrown out for 
for it. Number nine, Hornswoggle McMahon, who immediately crawls under the ring. At number 10, making his second straight classic pay-per-view appearance, it's custom Chucky P, a.k.a. Chuck Palumbo, a.k.a. Chuck. I don't know what he did between Billy and Chuck and custom Chucky P. I feel like he did something in between that, but my mind is uh, blank when coming up with that, so I'm just going to assume it was one than the other. But either way, custom Chucky P was basically doing the biker taker gimmick, but just for the mid-card. He came out with a motorcycle. He had Michelle McCool riding with the, the, on the bike with him. They were an item. He just recently turned heel by beating up Jamie Noble, who was making a pass at Michelle, but then also beat up Michelle McCool. So, and looking back here, you see McCool with this cool biker guy, and boy, I wonder if she has a type. Speaking of Noble, he comes out at number 11. He's got some bad ribs, and it's immediately his undoing when he is eliminated by Chuck. At number 12, it's CM Punk. He's not here to make friends. He's here to take off his shirt for a pop. We get a brief glimpse into WWE's future as baby Cody Rhodes enters at number 13. He is the other half of the tag team champions. And all I have to say, considering where we are today in 2023... Whoa! Number 14, Umanga! Out goes Holly. At number 15, it's Snitsky. He's stomping away when Cody tries pushing him out by flying into him. At number 16, The Miz, John Morrison's tag team partner and co-champion. Number 17 is Shelton Benjamin. He's off to a hot start, but is immediately kicked out by Shawn Michaels. Damn it, it's 2004 all over again. Number 18, Hall of Famer and likely murderer Jimmy Snuka. Then at number 19, it's his old rival Rowdy Ronnie Piper. He strips down to his trunks, which was a mistake as he and Snooka trade shots while everybody else just looks on. Seriously though, it is kind of a cool moment to see Snooka and Piper fighting out again in Madison Square Garden where they made some of their most iconic moments. So at least on that level, I gotta respect it. Number 20 is Kane, who eliminates the two Hall of Famers at the same time. Taker teasing he'll go to choke his brother, but psych, he's going after Sean. Number 21 is Carlito, who gets right to spitting and hitting. Nice sequence, by the way, with he, Morrison, and Punk here. Number 22 is Mick Foley, who actually qualified along with Hornswoggle a few weeks ago as they were a tag team together. At number 23, Mr. Kennedy, then at 24, Big Daddy V, the former Mabel slash Viscera, spending the last big run of his career in WWE without a shirt on for some reason. Taker eliminates Snitsky. Sean eliminates The Undertaker. Kennedy eliminates Sean. Taker gets his aggression out on Snitz before he leaves. There's a close call between Cody and Kennedy as Mark Henry enters at 25. Hornswoggle finally shows back up to help eliminate The Miz. Goes back under the ring. Number 26 is Chavo Guerrero. Kane eliminates Jomo. Hornswoggle finally gets caught and is in dire straits, but then Finley the Great Protector shows up with his shillelagh then just takes Hornswoggle away and I'm pretty sure he was never eliminated. You know, at this point, I'm pretty sure we can make an entirely new Royal Rumble match full of guys who were technically never eliminated from their matches. We also find out that Finley was meant to be next in the Rumble, but he jumps the gun this way and gets disqualified. Number 28 is Elijah Burke. Chavo eliminates CM Punk at this point. Number 29 is Triple H, the man who worked harder than probably anyone to get into this matchup here because he had the right to go to the Rumble match. He lost uh, the match with Ric Flair by shady circumstances from William Regal, so he was out of the Rumble, had to fight a gauntlet on Raw to finally get the spot in the matchup. So, again, looking at the scene from both Raw and SmackDown, if you're just judging who you think is going to win the Rumble based on, like, who had the most, like, struggle and who actually had, like, the most thing resembling a story of getting into the match itself, it's probably Triple H. He takes Cody out of the picture right away, along with Big Daddy V. Trips and Mick Foley exchanging strikes, shades of 2000, but Foley is taken out along with Elijah Burke. Triple H hits the pedigree on Umaga as the clock counts down one last time, and at number 30, his name is John Cena. Back from his pectoral surgery way before his expected return date, really showing just how much of a physical freak of nature Cena was at this time. He shows up to a big surprise, huge pop from the MSG crowd, even the ones who hate him are surprised by this. He eliminates Carlito, Chavo, Henry. Batista's back in. He eliminates Umaga. The final four are Cena, H, Kane, and Batista. Kane is dumped out, and the final three take turns taunting. Some back and forth. The H-man eliminates Batista, and we're down to he and Cena. They point to the sign. We get the yay boos. Cena now getting that old mixed reaction as he gets his big moves off on Triple H. 
more back and forth, close calls, Cena eventually gets him on his shoulders and hits the AA out of the ring to win. I give this Rumble match three stars out of five. I, I gotta say, if it were not for the John Cena appearance at the end, I think this would be a pretty forgettable Rumble. Kind of looking at everything in this landscape. I, you didn't see a whole lot of storylines being involved in this. You didn't see, uh, there was Piper and Snooka. Like that was kind of the big, oh my God moment. And again, it, the time and the place, it makes sense. I'll allow it. But beyond that though, it's like, eh, there wasn't really a lot that I was hooked into for this matchup. And you know, again, it was Cena showing up at the very end, defying expectations. And I mean, a lot of fans probably didn't expect this. I certainly didn't. I think it's easy to look back at this in like 2024 and say, oh yeah, well obviously the surprise was a good move for that matchup, it really elevated it, and I think that was kind of the right call. Uh, but at the same time, I think looking back, I probably would have had a different experience or a different opinion on that in 2008 at that moment. I, I was probably, I kind of remember watching that happening and thinking, okay, Cena won, at least it wasn't Triple H because that storyline bored me at the time. So yay for the surprise, but I'm still kind of like over, I'm kind of exhausted from too much John Cena exposure. And now we had him back all this time early, which again, great for him. And it's amazing how like superhuman he is here. But at the same time, it's like, could you have stayed away a little bit longer? Maybe? My final grade for the 2008 Royal Rumble at MSG is a C plus. You know, like I said here, it was a Rumble match itself. If it weren't for Cena's return at the end, I think this would be a pretty boring, pretty forgettable Rumble. Uh, you know, these matches that we see here, they don't really, are, are, they're not of much consequence. With Flair and MVP, you kind of know going in what you're going to get. And uh, yeah, really, I thought the Rumble match itself was not that exciting, not that interesting until the very end. And again, that was not through any fault of their, like, that wasn't because they wrote it that way. You know, that was a complete you know, surprise. In case of emergency, here's this new thing to get you awake again. So um, that's kind of how I looked at it. It was kind of just a mass show honestly, like not one of the stronger Rumble pay-per-views in my opinion. And then to be fair, this is not one of the stronger periods of time for them creatively. So I'm not surprised. But what did you think of the 08 Rumble? What'd you think of this review? Let me know in the comments section below. Now, as far as next time on the Classic Review, in the month of February, we're going to be doing a bit of a two-part story arc here. We start at the beginning of 2000 in WCW. I know it's very fertile territory, but we have to talk about that story as we have a champion down, four more stars are about to leave, and the company in general is in this creative disarray. We have to talk about that story before we talk about the fallout. We're gonna talk about WCW sold out 2000, and then two weeks later, we're gonna look at No Way Out 2000. But we're beginning with the WCW part of the journey. That's happening next time here. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.